Hi folks, welcome to session two, Functional Relations, Standard Units of Measurement, and Introduction to Experimental Design. I'm only going to spend a short time talking about experimental design in this session for two reasons. First of all, you'll be covering this topic in greater depth in subsequent classes, particularly when you get to the topic of functional analysis and the various analog designs that are used within the functional analysis approach. Secondly, we'll be covering experimental design directly and indirectly throughout this entire course uh, as we go through some of the experimental preparations. Uh, it's really hard to not talk about experimental design. So I'm just going to briefly go over uh, towards the end of session two, uh, replication reversal design versus multiple baseline. Just give you some examples. Instead, I'd like to spend the time talking to you about functional relations and standard units of measurement. Supposing you were driving on Interstate 25 and uh, you were right around the Thornton area, um, right around, that would be Thornton and uh, Westminster, and uh, you're driving 55 miles an hour and you get pulled over by a police officer who says to you, sir or, or madam, uh, I'm pulling you over because you're driving faster than everybody else on the highway. And the police officer uh, gets ready to write you a ticket and you say to the officer, but I was driving 55 miles an hour. I had my cruise control on, and it says 55, and I'm driving 55, so what's up? And the officer says, uh, well, sir, madam, uh, I have been out here clocking for the past hour all the drivers going southbound on Interstate 25, and I sampled 400 to 500 drivers and have found out that uh, your speed although it's 55, their speed mean uh, was approximately 43 miles an hour, and you are traveling 1.5 standard deviations over the mean of the drivers that I've been testing, and therefore, you will have to pay $100 as a speeding ticket. And of course, you would say, oh, gee, officer, shucks. Gee, that's unfair. Uh, what, a, what a crazy system. And you'd be right. It is a fairly crazy system. Why in the world would we ever want to evaluate the behavior of a driver relative to other drivers when we have a standard unit that we're using? Either you're speeding or you're not. 55 and under doesn't get a ticket. 55 or over does. Now, obviously, there's some variability in all of that. But still, your score uh, or your, your getting a ticket shouldn't be predicated based on how everybody else is doing particularly when you already have a standard that's already out there that people are using to drive 55 miles an hour. So that's what we're going to discuss uh, now, uh, various forms of measuring human performance. And uh, let me go ahead and freeze this, make sure I got this right. Hang on a second. Okay, we are ready to go. Okay, so let's take a look at the first slide in which we are going to look at and define this particular crazy system that the cop was using. It was actually called Vaganotic measurement systems, in which measurement scales that the police officer was using was based on variability. In this case, the variability of all the drivers who were driving during that observation period. Some were driving, obviously, below 55 and above 55. As, as luck would have it, when the police officer was doing the sample, most of the people who we sampled were driving below 55. Tough luck for you. Okay. And that value would have changed based on population size and what everybody else was doing. You know, if, if, if it was such that uh, everybody else was driving actually 60 or 65, you probably wouldn't have as much of a problem right now. Okay. So this form of measurement is called vagonotic measurement. It's the creation of scales and units of measurement based on observed variability in the items measured. In this case, 1.5 standard deviation was the scale that was used to give you a ticket. The word vaganotic stems from the word vaga, which means uh, to wander from place to place, sort of like a vagabond, wanders from place to place without a home, without it being able to establish roots in any particular place. And when we use vaganotic forms of measurement, we develop what's called vaganotic definitions in which we define things into existence based on observed variability. Okay, these things are not standard and absolute. They are defined into existence based on the observed variability we see in the population. These are some examples of vaganotic definitions. Intelligence, IQ, aptitude, scores on a personality uh, inventory. All of those things, uh, not surprisingly, are used in the social sciences and used to assess 
various aspects of human performance. And these uh, aspects of performance really are used to make decisions that are very important to individuals. What college you're going to go to, whether you're going to graduate high school or not. For many of the individuals I work with in developmental disabilities, this kind of a system is commonly used to determine whether they're going to receive funding or not, or what level of funding they are going to get. Okay. Again, it does seem to be somewhat of a crazy system, and it seems to be that this kind of a system is used particularly when it comes to human behavior in, in the social sciences. Compare that with what has been used for literally centuries in the natural sciences. Itemnotic units of measurement. And itemnotic units of measurement involve the use of standard and absolute units of measurement. And these units of measurement will exist independent of the variability of the things that are measured by that object. For example, if I have a tape measure which breaks things down into inches, less than inches, feet, yards, all of those things can be used, all those measures can be used to measure anything I want linear, linearly. For example, I could measure the height of my daughter or my son standing against the wall. I could measure the width of a doorway, uh, the uh, height of uh, curtains, uh, the width of my speakers. All of these sorts of things are easy to measure using this. And that yardstick or that tape measure does not change all of a sudden based on the fact that now I'm going to measure the length of a tablecloth versus now I'm going to measure the height of a doorway. It stays the same no matter what object I'm measuring. As long as it has linear properties to it, I could use it. And the same thing would hold true if I'm also going to be measuring using volume. If I wanted to measure a cup of water, a cup of broth, a cup of milk, a cup of, uh, what else, pina colada, whatever you want to actually measure. As long as we're talking about fluid volume, I could use that same thing to measure, and it doesn't matter what liquid I'm actually measuring. Now, these idemnotic units of measurement, the word idemnotic stems from the word idem, which means identical, and that's what standard and absolute units of measurement entail. Ident identical use of those scales, no matter what the object is that we're measuring. And we develop itemnotic units of measurement, which are used throughout the sciences, centimeters, grams, liters. We could combine them. We could have distance over time. Here we have distance, which is a standard unit of measurement, miles, 5,280 uh, feet uh, would indicate a mile, right? We, we ought to know that living in this particular state. And we could also combine that with standardized units of time. Hours, minutes, days, seconds, milliseconds, and so on. When we use itemnotic units of measurement with behavior, we have to recognize and come to agreement upon certain aspects of behavior. And these are four that we hold uh, to be true when we're dealing with uh, human behavior and all behavior in general. First, behavior is an interaction between the organism and the environment. And in Recognizing this, many of the experimental preparations we're going to be discussing in this class, you will see that we have devised ways in which we could uh, gain access to operant behavior emitted by the organism and be able to cleanly collect these data without much problem. Okay? You'll see these various things such as a lever press, a, a key pack, um, opening and closing a door. All of these sorts of things are easy to uh, described as interactions between organism and environment. Secondly, behavior is an intra-organism phenomenon. That is, behavior happens at the level of the individual and only happens at the level of the individual. Group behavior, which is oftentimes measured, we have to recognize that although we're collecting something called group or group average, the average really doesn't exist in any one subject. In fact, it is a mathematical derivative based on the behavior of all the individuals. Group behavior is the behavior of individuals. And this is something that you could read a little bit more in depth about this particular uh, aspect of behavior in the uh, Pearson Cheney book. Third, behavior is continuous and probabilistic. This essentially recognizes the fact that behavior is always ongoing. Even when we conveniently describe units of analysis arbitrarily where the response begins or ends, we recognize that behavior actually happens in long streams. It could happen all the time, all day long. 
and that we can never really accurately predict with 100% accuracy all aspects of behavior, we certainly know that behavior is probabilistic. That is, we could certainly determine the probability of behavior. We do so every single day that we are interacting with people. For example, it's probabilistic when we get in the car and we are driving that we see a green light. We know that there's a high probability cars going in, in the uh, opposite direction will stop at a red light. Now, that's not absolute. We can't always predict it. But based on certain kinds of uh, training, our history of reinforcement, and the way we have structured our culture and society, these are probabilistic things that we could rely upon and predict the behavior of drivers, and particularly drivers who we've never even met before. And we could do so by using something called rate. Rate comes very close to probabilities in the sense that behaviors that e are emitted at a very high rate are, have a very high probability of, a, of occurrence. Behaviors that occur at a very low rate usually have a very low probability of occurrence. We're going to come back and talk about all four of these later on when we get into operant behavior. We will also make distinctions between what we call stimulus classes, response classes, and so on. Now, that's covered in the current chapter for this particular session in Pearson Cheney. I recommend that you read that, but we will get into more depth on that when we get to operant behavior. Let's move on. Now, I uh, pulled this particular table from a book called Strategies and Tactics of Human Behavioral Research by Johnson and Pennybacker, and this just lays out as a table format the various aspects of behavior, the units of measurement that we use, and uh, various properties of behavior. For example, we recognize that uh, behavior could have temporal properties, uh, what we call temporal locus, in which we could have a response, or I'm sorry, a stimulus that occurs, and how much time occurs between the occurrence of that stimulus and response. For example, what is the latency of the time between the smoke detector going off and me getting up out of my easy chair and running outside to a place of safety? That would probably be a short latency. Other things have perhaps longer latency. The telephone ringing and me going over to answer the telephone. Now obviously that condition changes. If I'm expecting a call from my daughter or my wife or my son, I might have a very short latency. But if the call happens, and it's usually during the time like during dinner, we're eating a meal, we usually know that's when they people up or people want to involve us in some sort of a survey. So that phone may ring, but we may never answer it. It may ring and ring and ring until, of course, answering machine picks up or somebody just hangs up. A longer latency. We also note that behavior has short durations and long durations. We could see that behavior could be repeated again and again, repeatability, and therefore we could count every occurrence. Every single time the person gets up to answer the telephone, how many times during the season do they actually go out and ski, and so on. We could actually record this as units, as responses or cycles. We could look at that response over time, and we could have a frequency count. How often does the behavior occur over a period of time? How many times did you ski this week? How many times did you ski during the season? Okay. We could also look at these changes over time, the rate of behavior, and then the rate of behavior changing over time. At the very beginning of the season, if I'm just learning to ski, my rate of on skiing down a slope, I may be able to do three or four runs in a day and be completely exhausted. But by the end of the season, my rate may change, and I might actually have a higher rate of skiing 20 or 30 runs. You know, not that I could ever do that at my age, but it's nice to dream that I could still get out there and do lots of runs on one particular day. Okay? And then finally, we have something called an IRT, a little bit more complex. We'll talk about that later on. That's actually the time between two successive responses. And there are actually schedules of reinforcement that we look at uh, with this particular kind of uh, contingency of reinforcement in place. All right, let's move on. Characteristics of an experimental design. And here what we're going to do is compare the experimental analysis of behavior and applied behavior analysis approaches with what's typically done in the social sciences and psychology. For example, in experimental analysis of behavior, we use single subject design, and we analyze the behavior of individuals 
we rarely ever look at group design. We rarely ever look at group averages, although there are about three or four studies that we'll talk about um, in this course that uses a group design. But for the most part, these are far and few between. We tend to use continuous measure in the sense that we will measure uh, the behavior of one subject or uh, several subjects, look at the behavior individually over longer periods of time, maybe 30 or 40 or 50 sessions, maybe even longer, which is a lot different than actually studying large populations and aggregate populations, and then only doing that and studying their behavior once or twice and getting a small representative sample. It's very much the opposite approach is used in the uh, experimental design of behavior analysis. We analyze the behavior of, in, of individuals. We rarely will pool data into groups. Uh, we try to use experimental control in which we either hold variables constant or we try to eliminate variables, or what we call extraneous variables, something I'll talk about shortly. We don't try to use statistical control. I'll get to this in a moment. We do use itemnotic units of measurement, which are standard and absolute units. We do not use units of measurement, which are based on variability observed in the population. Finally, within our experimental design, we try to account for differences within individuals. We don't just assume that individuals are different and call that inherent and then say that it's beyond our control and control for it by using statistical analyses. Very different kind of an approach. Now, in scientific methodology, there are usually two ways that we could actually go. One way is that we could use correlational methods in which we are just sitting back and essentially just looking at some sort of aspect of our environment or behavior and just pencil and paper writing down things as we see this. And there's a lot of use for this and science certainly has a case in which this has been very, very useful. For example, we know that we cannot manipulate the tides, the movement of the planets, the, mo the moon, and so on. But with great accuracy, we are able to predict when high tide will occur, low tide, sunrise, sunset. And we've been able to do this literally for centuries without being able to literally control our subject matter by manipulating that and bringing it into an environmental space. Now, we've done little tiny experiments that might have led the way to do correlational methods better. But by and large, correlation has been used in the sciences and has great use in situations in which we just can't exert experimental control. And sometimes things will start out as a correlation. For example, let's say I am sitting on my summer vacation and I'm at the shoreline at Grand Lake just minding my own business, having a good time, maybe reading a book and, and sipping some root beer or something, and I hear this pounding coming towards me. It's getting louder and louder and louder. It sounds like things are being crushed in, in, in the woods. And all of a sudden, what appears about 10 feet away from me is an elephant. And the elephant looks at me and then proceeds to stick its trunk in the water and engage in behavior that I could only imagine must be drinking behavior. And I say to myself that I'm going to be scientific about this and figure out why in the world would an elephant appear at Grand Lake? And more importantly, what controls the behavior of this elephant drinking? So I take my pencil and paper. I start actually doing some observations. I may try to operationally define what is considered a bout of drinking. Maybe the trunk going into the water and then coming to its mouth. I would call that one episode and count how often this behavior occurs. I might actually be able to use a duration measure, except... If I'm going to do this right, I really can't have any tools of science. I can't have a compass to tell what direction things are. I can't use a thermometer because that would be cheating. I can't really um, use any of the other tools such as uh, a stopwatch to measure the duration. What could I learn about from this elephant in the absence of these tools uh, and technology of science? Well, the answer is actually quite a, quite a great deal. If I was to come there at 8 a.m. every morning and leave at 5 p.m. every day just to record on chance that the elephant will come by, down by the water, I may be able to record this behavior day after day after day. Now, I can't me really measure time of day, but I might be able to get a way of ascertaining the location of the sun over the lake every single time the elephant comes to this area. Uh, I may be able to count 
one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, and I might be able to get a, a, a rough idea of the duration of these drinks, as well as count with little tick marks how often the trunk goes into the water and then is followed by going into the elephant's mouth. Now here I'm getting possible duration and frequency of the behavior. I could also look at other correlates. Uh, for example, I might see that during different times during the day, behavior changes. As the sun is high overhead, I might actually have a longer duration and more bouts of drinking. I might follow the elephant around uh, perhaps afterwards or maybe try to scout out where the elephant is beforehand and see what does the elephant eat. Is there a correlation between what the elephant eats and how much drinking they do? Maybe when the elephant, uh, after they eat or drink, they, maybe before they eat or drink, they, they might urinate. Uh, and very carefully, if I follow the elephant, I might see that uh, when the elephant does not urinate, it drinks a small amount of water, but after it urinates, it is able to now drink lots more water. I sort of know this actually happens just by watching the behavior of, of my dog when he eats and drinks. So all of this stuff is useful, and I'm watching and observing over the course of about maybe two or three weeks, uh, as long as the observations are available and an elephant comes down to entertain me accordingly. However, on some of these occasions, I might find that as I'm just getting ready to collect the data, along comes these little kids running down to the water with, uh, with a raft and a, 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 a pail for putting sand in and laughing and screaming. And as they get closer to the water, the elephant gets distracted and just turns and walks off into the woods. And there goes my observation for the day. And maybe the next day that happens, somebody, little kids run down there. The next day everything goes well. The day after that I'm out there and all of a sudden maybe somebody is out there, a motorboat on the water dis disrupts the uh, elephant drinking. Now these things will happen from time to time when we're trying to make correlational methods of, of collecting data. And it leads us to saying, well, that's just the way life is. Or I might say to myself, It'd be a lot better if only I could hold those variables constant as much as possible. Now, these sorts of things are not new to science. And in scientific inquiry, there are many variables that would actually affect early studies and as we were studying elements. So in the laboratories, literally centuries ago, uh, many of the elements were studied under very close controlled conditions, what are called standard temperature and pressure. That is, if we hold temperature and pressure constant, we could study a whole array of different elements, metals, gases, and other things, and study their, their uh, behavior under very controlled conditions, and then systematically raise and change the temperature or pressure, and we could see uh, systematic changes in the thing that we're actually studying. The same thing actually would hold true with an elephant. The problem here is, is that it's a little bit tricky bringing an elephant under to control conditions into a laboratory. But since we live in the world of the imagination right now, I could do whatever I want. And I am going to devise a nice experimental condominium, if you will, suited for this particular elephant so I could study the behavior of drinking. Now, Grand Lake is not far from Tabernash, and I happen to have a buddy named Travis who has a, uh, a location down there. And I convinced Travis, being a behavior analyst, and I say to him, Travis, I got an experiment for us to run. Let's bring this elephant over to your place and we'll set it up under control conditions. So let's go out and buy a couple of cases, or let's say lots of cases of planters peanuts and lots of uh, fresh water from, oh, well, let's pick one of the local water places around here uh, in the Boulder, Broomfield, or maybe Boulder Water Company. And we're going to use the right water under control conditions. And we're going to study this elephant's drinking behavior. Okay? Now, under an experimental condition, we could control all of the variables, possibly, and allows for better prediction. I could eliminate extraneous variables. Nobody's going to come running in and pounding on the doors. I could hold variables constant. I could hold the temperature of the boulder water constant. I could hold the amount of uh, weight of how much peanuts I give the elephant to drink. And now I could actually study the behavior of drinking following eating peanuts and really do a nice controlled study to figure out why this elephant is drinking. What I won't necessarily do is to say, well, I'm going to not do this, and instead, I'll stay by the water, and I'm going to bring in 40 or more elephants all by the water side and look at the behavior of all of those individuals uh, across maybe one or two studies of observ observation days. We're not going to do that. We're going to do this. 
Now, before we get to the operant chamber and we examine the elephant's behavior, let's go over a couple of things in terms of what's called functional relations. I mentioned to you before, functional relations are very, very important in the science of behavior, but in science in general. Many of the sciences were nothing more than a quest to develop functional relations between environmental events taking place and whatever they happen to be studying, whether we're studying the behavior of reproductive behavior, geology, studying chemistry, physics, and so forth, functional relations are very close to something that we call cause and effect. That is, when I manipulate something in the environment, the cause, it has an effect on something that I'm studying. And I will manipulate the thing that I'm studying in the environment maybe study the parameters of that, maybe go from a small value to a high value, and I will see orderly changes in whatever I'm actually studying. So a functional relation evolves for every value of x, whatever I manipulate, I could look at a corresponding value of something and see a change, for example, in behavior in what I would call y. And I could put these on a simple axis, and I could develop what are called functional relations, and these become what we call laws, scientific laws. So let's look at some of these. The first one is called a direct relationship, which is called a monotonic increase, a perfect increase that for every value of x, and as I increase the value of x, I'm going to get a unique and increase in the value of y. And here what you're looking at is a simple graph, x, y coordinate. Now here is the x coordinate. Always remember the x coordinate is what I am going to use to plot my independent variable. It's the thing that I'm interested in studying. Whatever I'm going to manipulate, the values start at a low value here, and I increase it to a high value here. And again, this is on what is called the abscissa, or the x coordinate. Again, these are all described in Pearson Cheney book. And then I'm going to plot that on the thing that I am observing the effect on. This is actually called the dependent variable. It's dependent upon whatever I do on the independent variable. I manipulate this, and the effect on whatever I'm studying depends on this, the dependent variable. So on the x-axis goes the independent variable, which is the abscissa, and the ordinate is the y-axis, which is where I will plot what I'm interested in studying. In this case, it might actually be behavior. You're going to see, always see behavior is always going to be on the y-axis. Okay? And we see here for an, a value of x, which is right down here, I have a unique value of y. I go and increase the value of x. I come up, I have an increase in y. I go further and increase the value of x, and now I increase the value of y even more. You see this monotonic, mono meaning one. As one goes up, the other goes up, and that's a beautiful direct relationship. And we can see this across many of the sciences. Now that we have our laboratory all set up, our salt peanuts in place, our boulder water all set up, let's go back to the laboratory and do some manipulations with the elephant. I have the elephant in a nice comfortable climate of nice 72 degrees. The water is at a beautiful constant temperature of maybe, uh, oh, Let's hold that constant at about maybe about uh, 50 degrees or something like that, 55 degrees. Uh, and we have wonderful uh, planters peanuts, salt peanuts. And we're going to start off by giving the elephant on the first day uh, and hold constant, maybe give him three jars of peanuts and maybe he drinks a, a certain amount on that particular day. And the next day we give him the same amount of peanuts he drinks roughly the same amount that day. And every single day thereafter for the next two or three days, I give him the same number of jars of peanuts. Now, one day I'm going to come in there, I'm going to give him twice as much peanuts. And when I give him twice as much peanuts, increase that, I get more drinking. And I do that for a couple of days. And now I go in and I give him a case of peanuts. Boy, he must be a happy elephant because he's got a case of peanuts. And now I'm giving lots of peanuts, which has lots of salt. And I see the more salt peanuts I give them, the more drinking I get. And I develop a direct relationship which tells me the more peanuts I give this elephant, salt peanuts, the more drinking he does at any particular time. Okay. Now, this should not be a surprise to you, which is one of the reasons why when you go to a bar, they give you lots of peanuts to eat or popcorn to eat 
Or if you go to a Mexican restaurant, they give you all those chips and salsa, and you say to yourself, this is great, they give you all this free food. Well, there's a reason why they give you that, because drinking salty uh, or eating salty food induces drinking, and hopefully you're drinking their products. And the ones that actually cost money, like, you know, uh, Dos Equis or perhaps margaritas, which, by the way, they put salt on the rim of that. What a clever idea, right? And you thought it was just to enhance the flavor of the drinking. It just adds that much more sodium to your bloodstream, which induces more drinking. Okay? Uh, now, in terms of the sciences, there's something called Charles Law, which actually is a direct relationship, and it describes a direct relationship between temperature and volume. That is, as we increase the temperature on something, on a cylinder, volume goes up. So uh, when we, for example, increase, if we're driving along in our car and we're driving many, many miles and we fill our, uh, we get our gauge filled at, say, 32 pounds per square inch when the temperature of the tire is cold. But if we drive around for, you know, several hours in the summer, we know that what happens, that if we go and measure the, uh, the volume in the tire, it's going to be higher in terms of pounds per square inch. Why? Because temperature is increased and therefore the volume will increase. Okay. All right. There you have it. Now let's look at another relationship called an indirect relationship, which is again also a monotonic increase. But unlike Charles' law, which says that one increases, x increases, and y increases, we have just the opposite. As we increase the value of x, y actually decreases. So let's take a look at what that looks like. That is, at low values of x, we have a whole lot of y happening, right? Low value of x, a lot of y. But as we increase the independent variable and increase the value of x, y gets less and less and less and less over time, okay? Lots of things actually look like this. For example, our own eating behavior. If we are not really food deprived, right? We just ate like about three hours ago, and then somebody comes and looks at our um, eating behavior, okay, our eating behavior would be low, right? Why? Because we had just eaten, we had a lot of food to eat. But the more time that passes, we have less food in our stomach, right? And that increases the probability of our behavior. Less food in our stomach, more food deprivation, will result in us probably eating a lot more. But as time passes, the more food we eat, and as more food fills up our stomach, it goes from low to high, the rate of eating slows down over time. Now, you'll be reading about in the current um, chapter about establishing stimuli and establishing operation, which gets at some of the motivational variables. We'll cover that later on when we get to operant behavior. Okay? So here's an indirect relationship. We see this, by the way, if we were going to look at the effects of drugs on behavior, and in particular, the effects of anticonvulsant medications such as Tegretol, Depakote, Topamax, Lamictal. These are just some of the many different kinds of anti-seizure medications. Now, when seizures are not on board or very, very low doses of that anticonvulsant medication, we have lots of seizures, right? High amount of seizures, very little anticonvulsant medication on board. As we increase the dose of Depakote or Tegretol, and that increases, what happens to seizures? They become less and less and less frequent. Maybe they go down in frequency. Maybe the duration of the uh, seizures actually go down. So we see an indirect relationship here very, very clearly, right, as we see that medication going up. And we also see this as one of the uh, scientific laws called Boyle's Law in which we see the relationship between pressure and volume. When pressure is very low on a cylinder, we see a lot of volume. But as we are on the outside increasing the pressure on the outside of a cylinder, what happens to that piston inside? That piston goes down and it increases the pressure and it causes volume to go down. Okay. Now this is a very popular gas law that we have to know. Boyle's law is important because when you are actually coming up from, say, 60 or 70 uh, feet uh, depth in the ocean after diving, you come up to approximately 15 feet. You're, it's highly recommended that you stop at 15 feet for about three minutes to go through decompression because as you are coming up, 
the gas, uh, nitrogen gas that's actually in your blood, those little bubbles there, start increasing in size. The volume is changing. Why? Because the pressure, as you're coming up from the ocean depths, the pressure is getting less and less and less, which means that what's happening to those bubbles, they're actually getting bigger and bigger. And you've got to be very careful that you go through decompression. Otherwise, you can get all kinds of nasty problems like the bends and all kinds of uh, other problems that will happen. All right. Finally, we could have what's called a bitonic relationship, where as x increases, behavior will increase to a point, and then thereafter, behavior starts decreasing. Now, I, I put this here. We won't have a chance really to talk about this uh, in our class, but there is a phenomenon uh, that's described in Pearson Cheney. It's called schedule induced or adjunctive behavior. It's in the interaction between. Uh, uh, genetic and environmental interactions. I forgot which chapter that is, but you could probably look it up in your index. And you'll look up bitonic functions, and we'll talk about an interesting thing called schedule-induced polydipsia, or schedule-induced drinking, in which what we see is, is that right after food is delivered under certain circumstances to rats and pigeons and monkeys, um, as we increase the inner food interval, going from fixed interval low values to higher values, if we find out that right after food's delivered, rats, pigeons, and monkeys will drink massive amounts of water, much more so that they would drink right after this little bit of food than they would actually drink in a 24-hour period. And we find that how much drinking they do right after food delivery is directly related to the inner food interval. As we increase the fixed interval value from Fi2 to Fi4 to Fi6, we see right after the animal gets food, they drink more and more and more water. You see that right here? We see that here. At higher values, actually drinking goes down. It's by value. It goes up to a certain point, and then as the inner food interval, the fixed interval schedule goes out further and further, we get less and less of this. Interestingly enough, we also study something called schedule-induced attack. That is, one animal will attack another animal right after a reinforcer is delivered, and we have that same bitonic relationship here relating schedule-induced behavior in general to inner food intervals. So again, this is the bitonic function. All right. Now, we could also record behavior in a, many different ways. At one extreme, we could record behavior continuously 24-7. That is, as long as the person is alive, breathing, or whatever, we record the behavior because it's important for us to collect all behavior that occurs. Now, again, this is going to be dictated by whatever the behavior of interest is. And some things really dictate that we do got to collect it 24-7, all day long. Such things as seizures, the frequency of seizures, uh, self-injurious behaviors, physical aggression, property destruction, things that are important to the individual or persons immediately in the environment of the individual, and we would want to record this continuously. Sometimes things don't have to be recorded continuously because they don't occur all the time. They occur what we say stimulus bound. That is, they only occur during certain times, and although the behavior could occur at other times, rarely do they occur. Now, there used to be a behavior that I'd studied back in the 80s called rumination. This type of behavior is actually a pretty serious behavior. It involves an individual. Right after they've eaten food, they are able to uh, bring food up from their stomach through their uh, esophagus into their mouth, swoosh it around in their mouth, and swallow it again, and do this repetitious, repetitiously, ruminating, sort of like cows will actually do from time to time. Uh, we actually see humans do that as well. It's a dangerous behavior because... Bringing that you know, stomach acid up again and again in the esophagus is, is very bad for the esophagus. So we might actually study this behavior and write a behavior plan to reduce the frequency of rumination behavior. But we won't actually study this all the time, although rumination behavior could occur all the time. We find that rumination is very much a, a meal-bound kind of event. That is, it happens mostly post-meals, after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner. And it will happen usually about an hour to about an hour and a half after you're going to see the highest frequency of this behavior. So when we would actually do these interventions, we would actually teach our staff to sit there, uh, operationally define what is rumination behavior, that every time we sit there and watch them and their cheeks all of a sudden puff out, and they looks like they engage in a swallowing behavior, we would count that as one bout of rumination. Okay. All right. And then finally, we might actually have 
a, a need to not collect all the behavior occurs in the sample, but just whether did the behavior occur, yes or no. You don't necessarily care about frequency. You just care, were they there, yes or no, that's all that really matters. Now, this really runs the gamut of going from intense amount of frequency recording to perhaps a lot less frequency recording to the point at which you're not collecting frequency at all, you're actually collecting all or none. Now, there are going to be different circumstances which will dictate which method you use, and you'll be covering these topics in later courses subsequent to the course that you're enrolled in now. Let's talk a little bit about reliability. One of the things that becomes clear is that if I am back at my friend's house and we are watching that elephant drink and I give, you know, uh, 10 bottles of peanuts and I look at how much drinking occurs and then I study this for a couple of days and then I give 20 bottles of peanuts and then 30 bottles of peanuts and I increase this systematically, I will probably observe this nice monotonic direct relationship the more peanuts I give, the more I see the elephant drink. Now, I could go back from 30 peanuts, 30 jars, to 20 jars, to 10 jars, go back to baseline and not give any peanuts, then back to 10, back to 20. And each time I do this, I'm going to show again and again and again the same phenomenon, which is really not much different than if I take a pot of water from the tap, from the tap put it on the stove, and observe by increasing the frequency of how, how much uh, temperature I apply to the water, that the water will boil faster. I could do this again and again, and the more times I do this, the more reliable the results. Reliability happens when the more times we repeat this test of a consequent event, that is, apply heat to water, increase the amount of salt peanuts I give to an elephant, I actually am able to test the, the, this consequent event again and again and again, and each time I affirm that consequent event by getting the same results, it increases the reliability of the relationship that I'm studying, and in general, makes me a heck of a lot more confident so that when somebody comes along and says, Dr. Kupfer, what happens when you put water on and apply heat to it? We know what the answer is going to be. It's a reliable effect. Okay. Let me show you another reliable effect. Years ago, when I was working with individuals in a uh, day program, one of the jobs that we would have to do was get them ready for vocational activities. And we used to have a job that we had developed uh, through a company. It was a department store out in Massachusetts that would supply us with a big bag of nuts and bolts and washers, just these big, thick plastic bags. And it was our consumers who would take these objects and actually sort them out. And these were used, by the way, for uh, assembly of uh, bookcases, uh, uh, TV stands. And uh, we actually had the contract. They give us the bags. We would have to sort them out, put them in their separate bags, seal them up with a, like a heat sealer, send them back to the department store, and they would actually go ahead and package them uh, for retail sale. Now, when we actually did this, we would collect baseline with some of our individuals in terms of how well they were actually able to uh, do this sorting test. You could see here during baseline conditions, and this is consecutive days, that from time to time the rates would go up, down, up, down. But you see that overall the, we had an average here of approximately eight of these units done per hour that I was able to get some of uh, my um, individuals to, these eight bags per hour. And this is actually just unit looking at the units per hour of being able to uh, do sorting tasks. We introduced for these folks uh, variable ratio reinforcement. And for these guys, what we did was based on an average number of completed bags, we would give them a type of uh, paycheck. Now, we really weren't able to give them actual paychecks here because back in uh, Massachusetts at the uh, day program, you were not actually allowed to uh, use uh, employment in these settings. You were, uh, these were day programs. So therefore, we had to use what they would eventually do is uh, graduate to pre voc and then vocational settings. So we gave them a simulated paycheck. And they were able to actually pay, take that paycheck and trade it in later on, go to the, you know, the uh, in-house store and 
make purchases with that. We could see that variable ratio reinforcement seemed to increase productivity. Now, it could be that I could have just simply run the study going from baseline to variable ratio treatment, got the effect I was looking for, and stopped the study. Okay? But maybe he was just motivated to work a little bit more from this day to this day when I made the change. So one way to actually test that idea is to go back to baseline, go back to the conditions before there was variable ratio reinforcement delivered. And what we see here is, is, is that when we take away the token reinforcement, the behavior comes back down to baseline levels. We introduce it again, it comes back up. Now we have again, we have produced this second consequent event. It could be that it was just a fluke that he decided to work more this day, but the more you're able to go from baseline to treatment, to baseline to treatment, to baseline to treatment, and every time thereafter you are building a case that increases the reliability of reinforcement effects on behavior, number one, but also our confidence. I'm pretty confident that under these conditions, each day I know what's going to happen. Okay? This is what we would actually call a replication reversal design, or what we call ABAB, phase A, phase B. Go back to phase A, go to phase B. And each time we do this, we make a very strong case for reliability. Okay? Now, in some instances, when we're studying behavior, it might not make a whole heck of a lot of sense to go and do this replication reversal. For example, here's a variation on a basic theme called the multiple baseline. With that same individual, we actually took a baseline across two different tasks. The first task was that original sorting task. That is, you take a bag and you separate out all the washers from the, from the um, bolts, from the nuts, and you separate them out and then you bag them up separately. But one of the other things that we found out in working with our consumers was not only was how fast they were able to do this sorting task was important, but more importantly to the department store was accuracy. Because it doesn't help if they produce this fast, but some of the bags have more nuts in it than bolts. How do you guys feel whenever you actually get a, a TV stand or something that requires assembly from a department store? You open up the bags and there's one bolt short or one nut short. And then you start saying, how am I going to do this? And so on. And what ends up happening is sometimes companies would actually give extra nuts and bolts and washers. That comes to cost the company a little money. It gets rid of the problem that uh, the customer is going to come up short. On the other hand, it's a little bit costly to do that for every single item that you sell if you're a company. Accuracy really does measure. And one of the things that we learned with our consumers was that if you were working with them on the sorting task and they simultaneously do an assembly product where they take one bolt out of a bag, one nut out of a bag, and one washer, and you hold the bolt up, put the washer on, and put the nut on just two turns, now you are absolutely certain, for the most part, that accuracy will be almost at 100%. So you've got the rate and you know that they're going to have the exact number of nuts and bolts and washers. So we used to teach this task as well. Now here's the baseline across these two behaviors across consecutive days. Sorting, assembling. We introduce variable ratio reinforcement for the sorting task and we see a change. But we held off on introducing it down here for the assembly task. And then we don't see the effect down here. And we won't see the effect here until we introduce variable ratio reinforcement here. Now, in this instant, we were able to see the consequent event shown once, twice, and actually three times. When we introduced it here, we didn't introduce it here. So right in this period here where we have no change upon implementing the contingency here, we see the third affirmation of the consequent event. Okay? Why would we actually do this? Because sometimes it really doesn't make sense to do an ABAB design. That is, baseline treatment, baseline treatment. For example, if you have an individual you're working with who has a moderate to high rate of self-injurious behavior, and during baseline conditions you record that rate, and you introduce your treatment effect, and you are able to actually reduce the self-injurious behavior, do you really uh, want to go back to baseline 
to have those self-injurious behaviors come back just so that you could show it was your clinical effect that made the difference. For example, if I am able to take self-injurious behavior and reduce it, I could actually use a multiple baseline to show that my clinical effect occurred across three conditions rather than having to re-expose the person to baseline to get all of that self-injurious behavior to come back. Now again, these are strategies we're going to be talking about in much later classes. But you can see how we did this multiple baseline. With this individual, the self-injurious behavior was excessive finger biting. And this, and this gentleman used to bite his fingers, you know, pull his nails off. It would call, result in, you know, blood on the objects he was working on. So this was a pretty nasty behavior uh, to have in a day program. And we noted that the behavior of finger biting occurred under demand situations, primarily when this individual was asked to start working. This is the working environment. This is the exercise environment, and he was asked to work. And here, he was asked to actually clean up the table around him right after he finished dining or after his lunch. And we took the baseline across these three behaviors of finger biting, and we introduced a program called Variable Non-Responding, or what we call DRO, Differential Reinforcement of Other Behaviors. Essentially, we just recorded uh, the frequencies of which uh, the behaviors were occurring, and whenever... Uh, finger biting did not occur for a brief period of time in the environment, we gave token reinforcement to the individual to be traded later on for backup reinforcers of, of his choice. Uh, that could be chips or soda or something like that. And you can see when we introduced this variable non-responding under this condition uh, during working, we started to see a reduction in finger biting using this DRO program. However, we did not introduce it in setting number two, which is the exercise setting, or in setting number three, the dining room setting. When we go ahead and introduce it into this setting over here, we see a second affirmation of the consequent event. That is, we see a decrease in finger biting during these um, exercise sessions, but no real change down here. And then we introduce this DRO down under this condition. You got very, very small decreases in self injurious behavior, but it really wasn't occurring that much in this setting anyway. So you see the affirmation of the consequent event once, you see it twice, you see it sorta, kinda, three times, and then you see it here and here in the sense that when you introduce the contingency here, you did not get a decrease here or here. When you introduce the contingency over here, you saw a decrease here but you didn't introduce it over here. So here's another affirmation of the consequent event. Again, you will be discussing these particular kinds of experimental designs in greater detail as you start reading through the studies in Java in later classes. Let me just show you a couple of uh, other examples briefly about some multiple baseline design. In this example, the study that was done in 1970s, this was a study in which they were looking at the behavior of a person named Andy, and they were going to teach him uh, public speaking. And it was a treatment package on ways in which you can improve your public speaking across three different gestures, or th I'm sorry, three different behaviors. One, good eye contact, because good public speaking means that you're looking at your audience often, not reading from paper, but looking at your audience. Eye contact, the use of hand gestures appropriately, talking with your hands. And then third, what is called uh, speaking behaviors, just your ability to pause, articulate, emphasize, and so forth. So these are the three behaviors that comprised good public speaking. They took a baseline across all three of these behaviors with Andy, and you could see that occurred at fairly low frequency across all three conditions of baseline. Then the authors introduced the first instructional design, teach Andy only about eye contact and how important it is. And you can see subsequent public speaking, eye contact improved. But what didn't improve was gestures and public speaking itself, speaking behaviors. They stayed low because they did not introduce the treatment package here. When they introduced the treatment package for gestures, we see an increase in the ability to use gestures and eye contact, but still public speaking remain low because they had not done that part of the teaching package yet. And finally, when you introduce that part of the te teaching package, now all of a sudden you've got effective teaching, gestures, and eye contact. Okay, Increases all three. This is, would be a multiple baseline across behaviors within one experimental subject. The last one I'll show you 
is a study that was done again in the 70s. In this instance, this was a study that was used to increase the use of prosthetic devices. In this case, David trying to get him to wear his glasses, Greg trying to get him to wear his hearing aid. Here are the baseline conditions for both David and Greg. You can see, except for one day here, that Greg wore his, uh, his hearing aid 100% of the time. For the most part, it was flatline zero for both of these subjects. That's the experimenters introduced token reinforcement for David whenever he was wearing glasses. They would go out there and give him tokens, and we see an increase now in the frequency in which the uh, uh, reliability checks in which he was actually wearing his glasses. Uh, in the same environment, they did not start giving tokens, though, to Greg for wearing his hearing aid, and we did not see improvement in wearing his hearing aid. When we introduce the hearing aid uh, token reinforcement for Greg, we see an increase, decrease, by and large, more increases than decreases, okay? And we still were able to sustain uh, a higher rate of wearing glasses for David. When they went back to David uh, for baseline for David, behavior came back down to zero, but you could see right here, they had not stopped token reinforcement for Greg, so Greg continued to wear his glasses until, of course, they went back to baseline for Greg. You could see that here, and his behavior went back down to zero. And while his